I'm um, really, really pleased that we've got uh, Lou and Rod Heichel with us this evening. Um, we've invited them over to have what I call a conversation about cruising. Um, we've talked about some serious stuff today and we've, we've looked at boats. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, that you're considered a guru when it comes to cruising sailing. That's a, that's a horrible word, isn't it, guru? But um, I thought it'd be fun to, to get you guys to talk about your cruising life, which is a fairly broad subject, but um, part of the, the mission for this weekend is to inspire people, and, and nothing inspires as much as a tale of, of um, people that have been there and done it. So I'm going to hopefully um, pull some anecdotes and some stories out from you and uh, uh, try and inspire and encourage and, and possibly uh, add a bit of uh, knowledge to people as well. So. Um, that's the objective of, of this evening, and, and then you can have a glass of wine. We haven't forgotten that bit. So. Anyway, really good to have you guys here. Um, Rod, you're best known for your Mediterranean pilots, and um, I, I know that you kind of uh, had a very small boat and set sail for the Med. What was it that prompted you to, to head that way, first of all? Um, what happened is I just didn't have very much money, so that meant um, that all I could afford was an old 20-foot ply boat, hard chine. Um, it cost, I think, 600 pounds in 1976. Had a four-horsepower Stuart Turner that never worked. Um, and sailed it down to Greece. This was supposed to be a one-off. Was that more in hope than knowledge, do you think, at the time? <laughs> uh, you're right, actually. Crossing the channel, yeah. I remember being seasick, finally seasick, and thinking, what is this all about? This is awful. But in fact, you know, somehow I recovered, you know, on going across the, going across the channel and arrived in St. Marlow. And apart from really having a heart attack, because I arrived there at high tide, and then after the, the 11 meter tide goes all the way to the bottom, I was tired. So I woke up and looked up and thought that something had fallen on top of me. <laughs> <laughs> it was this huge wall. But uh, I don't know, I just, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, it's, uh, it's all a mystery. Did you just sort of wake up one morning and think, I have to go sailing? Or what was it that sort of prompted you to leave home and head for the Med? Well, I'm, I'm a Kiwi originally, so I came over here to do some post-grad work. And I think I just got bored with it all. <laughs> I was sort of sitting there for a while. And somehow in Buckinghamshire, in the middle of nowhere, um, I used to sneak off to the library and get books and magazines and bring them back. and sort of put them under the work that I was supposed to be doing so I could pull them out like a naughty boy and read them. And that's what I did, you know. And, you know, this stuff just seeps into you in the end so that, you know, you have a desire. When you grow up in New Zealand, you're miles from anywhere. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a three-and-a-half-hour flight from Auckland to Sydney. Um, whereas when you live here, it's a three-and-a-half-hour flight to Athens. And... I think sometimes that, you know, Brits don't understand how lucky they are to have this all on their doorstep. So my thing was just to go down through this, this Europe, which I'd never seen before, see these countries, um, the cultures, and wind up in Greece, sell the boat, and then go back to New Zealand. Um, so did you have a plan to write a cruising guide on the way, or did it, was it just your notes on back of the cigarette packets that turned into a book? How, how did that bit come about? Well, it really started because what happened when I got down there, I didn't have any money. And there was a Fertilla company, Fertilla Sailing Club, um, which needed somebody to clean the boats, do a few deliveries, run the boats backwards and forwards. So I did that, you know, and you're being paid to go sailing. It's like, wow. So, so I did that, and then I got headhunted for no good reason um, by another company that was starting up a, a company in the Saronic. And so I got out there, not knowing the area. I mean, the first time we went out, I had to zoom around all these anchorages and get there first, and then with a sort of air of nonchalance, sort of go, yeah, I knew this was all here. This is where you go, you go here, you go there. In fact, I didn't. And it occurred to me that, you know, I should really do a booklet of all these places. Um, with harbour plans, you know, how to get into the harbours, depths, where to moor up, and what there was ashore as well. So it started off with a booklet for, for, a, for a charter company. It grew from that. You obviously enjoyed that, that side of it as well, so did you find that you get inspired by writing and, and 
Um, or is it the research? I'm sure that is both. enjoyable. Both. I mean, <laughs> research is great. I mean, you know, it's sort of, especially if you can include, you know, restaurants and things in there. But um, what happened after that is that I worked for the for the charter company for a couple of years, um, and then thought, right, okay, before I'm still going back to New Zealand. So before I go back to New Zealand, I'll write a book on Greece, all the harbours. I wish I hadn't been so stupid and I'd looked at how big Greece is and how squiggly it is, and how many places there are, because I think I nearly had a nervous breakdown um, sailing around there, making these plans. And I also remember writing the first two chapters. And it was like this, this awful academic language where you cover everything. Um, and I read through it and thought, no, actually, nobody wants to read that. That's awful. So I had to rip it up and start all over again. Um, but after I'd done that, then uh, Imre's, um, Willie Wilson, um, said, well, you know, you ought to do Italy. And it was like, so I did yacht deliveries. I did photography for various charter companies. I did anything, really, that I could do to, uh, to make money. And, um, and wrote the books on the side. So that's, that's how it started. So do you think of yourself as a cruising sailor who writes books or as a, an author who goes sailing? A cruising sailor who writes books. Good answer. I mean, good answer. Good, you know, uh, definitely. Um, I'm going to sort of throw this question at the both of you because I know um, uh, it's our cruising life we're talking about. Um, cast back to times you've sailed there and places you've been, um, would you would you say that the Med is, is too busy to enjoy or is it still possible to find uh, the kind of sailing you used, to, you used to know when you first went there? I think the, the answer to that actually encompasses sailing around the world. I mean, sailing has become a lot more popular than, uh, than it was. So, you know, most parts of the world are more crowded with people sailing than, uh, than used to be the case, and this applies to the Med as well. However, in most places, there are sort of motorways, yacht motorways, where people go. And, you know, if you go off the dirt tracks on the side to other places, then you can find quite remote places. I mean, the most remote place I've sailed in the world, and this is strange, is Australia, um, from Cairns to Darwin. I mean, you know, there are no roads, there's Lizard Island, and, you know, and a port, I forget, that's a mineral mining port. But apart from that, we're sailing for whatever it was, 2,000 2, miles. 2,000 plus miles, yeah. Yeah, 2,000 miles with with nothing, just little remote bays, and uh, you could spend ages around there. Um, in the Mediterranean itself, um, you know, parts of Greece are more popular than others, but you sort of get used to it. You know, I mean, the Ionian, we always come back to when the boat is there at the moment before we set off this time going west. Um, but, you know, if you go sort of down past Sarkinthos and down just a little bit into the Peloponnesus, then you know you're in you're in an area which has a lot fewer boats, and you know going around the, the Peloponnese is just. So how do great. you with, with so many places to go to? How do you um, how do you make up your cruising plan? I mean, Lou, do you sort of have first choice because you haven't been to so many of them, or, or is it just well we had a lovely time there? Or the, I, I remember a nice restaurant in this place. We'll go there. How much? planning do you put into your cruising? I, th I think it's a bit of everything. Um, a lot of it's to do with the uh, rotation of the books and, 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 and uh, obviously we're, we're looking to... I wish it were more scientific but, but uh, you, you do try to visit places um, as books come up but uh, it's, it's a far from scientific plan but uh, I think going back to what Rod said, you know, in terms of um, busy places, it, it, it's a sort of old sore in some ways, but I think it still holds that 80% of the people go to 20% of the places. Um, and, 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 and so naturally we concentrate a lot of our research on the 20% of the places, but our reward is kind of to go to the go to the, the other the other 80% and, and yes it's it's um, some of it's me nagging Rod saying, we haven't been there yet. <laughs> um, and other bits uh, 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 are us both just going, 
oh, should we go back up to northern Greece again? You know, um, so it's, yeah, it's some and some. Would you say that Greece is your favourite med destination or is it just the one you know best? Um, it's probably... Um, <laughs> It's impossible to say. Uh, I think it's impossible to pick between. Um, I mean, I I love many much of, of 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 the Eastern Med. I guess Eastern Med more than Western Med, personally. But I'll hand you over to Ronald as well because he's 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 got he's got favourites. No, I, I was just going to say the same thing. The Eastern Med. I mean, we always we always come back there wherever we've been. I mean, this time we're headed back over the Caribbean, Greater Antilles up the east coast of the States. But we will always usually make a fairly quick beeline through Spain until we get to Sardinia, pasta and Italian wine, um, Corsica maybe, and then into Greece. Um, in lots of ways, the Eastern Med is sort of, it's my spiritual home. I mean, it's, it took me something like seven years with me going, yeah, next year I'm going back to New Zealand. Yeah, next year I'm going back. Until you wake up one morning and go, I don't think I'm going back. <laughs> I'm just, I'm here. So, no, I mean, you know, we, I love it. I, I love, I love the culture. Um, I love the, just the feeling of being there. And I love the way of life. I think it, it has a, a humanness and a civilized quality to it that is lacking in some other parts of the world. Is it um, is it the destination that draws you to the cruising life, or the cruising life that takes you to the destination? Ah, well, there's an old Kavafi poem, uh, Ithaca, which says, you know, that you should always take your time. This is Odysseus going home to Ithaca, and the you know he says, you know, it's, it's always the journey. You, know, you don't have the journey, just just keep going and and you know and take delight in the journey because when you arrive it's just like oh yeah I've arrived that's it end. so you mentioned um, the joys of of, of um, Sardinia as a as a foodie destination um, you've written a very well received book called the Trade Wind Foodie um, what was it that prompted you to um, to take up that challenge, slightly different from um, from normal pilot books. <laughs> there's, yes, there's an obvious. We both like our food very much, but I I have to actually sort of slightly fess up here because I've there've been many people, lovely people here today saying, Lou, would you would you sign 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 your book? Which I'm delighted to do, and I did do some of the work, but we're in a, a happy position where we both love cooking and. Actually, if anything, Rod does more than me. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Rod here to talk to, talk to you about the book because uh, he did most of it. <laughs> well, yes, but you know. <laughs> but, you, uh, you had to eat the results, so oh, you're involved in the project. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, no, it also, you know, it also has a bit about the history of food and things like that, which, which I've always been interested in. Um, it's, you know, the recipes, we just try them out on board. And in this respect, um, Americans, Australians, Kiwis, I think, are often the, often some of the best people at cooking on board. You know, they're, they're very good at putting things together from whatever you can get. And the art of cooking on board is really to do with making do with what you've got. Um, you know, I know a lot of people on the Ark and, 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 uh, and other rallies will have you know, a freezer full of, full of food, but there's this thing I call the tyranny of the freezer, where you have to keep you know, either running the generator or doing something else to keep the freezer frozen. And that means that you very rarely get to go ashore and do things. You, know, you can't go on a, a two-day trip, trip up into the, the highlands of Sri Lanka, or you can't go on a five-day trip through Thailand, because otherwise, all your, all your frozen food is going to go off. Um, so, and there are lots of good dishes you can make with, you know, not freezing everything on board. We have a freezer, but we don't run it as a freezer. We run it as a very cold drink store. <laughs> and Labrador's love food. I haven't got any You mentioned food, food. Yeah, you think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just a book. <laughs> anyway, not digestible. 
Um, what would you say to people in terms of um, culinary adventures in far-flung places? And again, I'm, I'm kind of directing this to both of you in terms of um, strange things that might be strange until you encounter them for the first time, or uh, you must really try cooking with, I don't know, dasheen or something. What, what, what are these weird and wonderful things that you might see in the Caribbean, perhaps, that you can encourage people to, to try? Uh, well, in the Caribbean, I just say, you know, just be careful of the hot sauces because they are really hot. But I think one of the things is people worry about eating ashore. The only places I've had food poisoning from was a very flash restaurant in Los Angeles um, and another very flash restaurant in Cairns in, in, in Australia. I mean, we've eaten in street markets, you know, sitting in stalls and street markets everywhere. And some of it is just fabulous. I mean, you know, there are places... You know, the, the, what they call the night markets in, in Southeast Asia where, you know, roads are closed off and people come along and got little barbecues and, and you know, you've got fish, um, you know, kebabs, all sorts of things which are just caught there. And some of it is just, frankly, amazing food. Um, but there are also... One of the things we have on board, we have a lot of competitions on board just to keep things interesting, but one of them is the, the daily log. Um, and that means at midday when we're doing the log, we do the log, a manual, you know, a paper log every three hours. Um, at midday, you've got to guess what the next day's mileage is going to be. And this becomes a really important competition because whoever wins it gets the meal of their choice, <laughs> the restaurant of their choice, and the wine of their choice when we arrive paid for by the others. So, <laughs> I can tell you, it becomes really serious. Um, talking about uh, finding interesting food, it, it is part of the joy of travelling um, on, a, on a boat specifically as opposed to on land where you tend to eat out. Um, the markets, um, wherever you are, um, if you're stopping at the Cape Verde, it's one of the joys in Mindelo to go to the market. Um, and you will see, whether it's in Mindelo, whether it's in the Caribbean, whether it's further on, you will see weird and wonderful things. Um, the best thing about going to a market, of course, is that you can talk to the people about what these things are and find out what they do with them. And, and, and then you, you scratch your head a bit and think, oh, i um, not sure about that. But give it a go, because some of it's fantastic, some of it is awful. <laughs> um, but that's the joy of it. That's, that's, uh, for me, that's a huge part of exploring, is, is, is uh, a way into a culture, learning about a different culture is through their food, I think. Um, while, you, while you've got the microphone, I'm, I'm going to stick stick the subject with you and mo move on slightly from food. We were talking earlier a little bit about single sideman. I know it's one of your passions on board the boat, um, and it's it's unusual to use HF radio on this side of the Atlantic quite so much. Certainly, maybe in the Mediterranean more, but certainly not in Euro Northern Europe. Would you like to just kind of explain to people what it is about SSB that you enjoy and and why what got you into it? What, what what's the buzz for you on using the radio? Um, the buzz was getting better weather information. Having gone through Tropical Storm Peter, um, I think it was the second time I went across the Atlantic, I thought it would be better to, to, to get some more, um, some, some improved weather information. Um, so uh, I, took, I took a SSB course. So from being, I went from being a little bit, as I think Jeremy said, you know, you've got this big overgrown VHF but it's not a VHF. Um, you're a little bit scared of it. Um, you don't really understand how it works. Four days later after a course, you come out and think, hey, this could be a really, really useful piece of kit. And, and it's, I call it white magic because it's not like a sat phone in that you turn it on, it's there, it works or it doesn't work. It's, it, it, you do, um, you do need to, it, it is more complicated, but once you have an in, and if you have a, 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 a little bit of interest, it's a, it's, it's a window on the world, frankly, because um, with a sat phone, you can talk to your mum. With a radio, you've got an audience of, of 
of anybody within 4,000 miles on a good day. Do you, do you think as a, as a double-handed cruising couple that it's important occasionally to be able to talk to people outside the boat? Do you find that useful? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, we, 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 we were going across the Pacific and, and um, I had a, 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 a cyst on my neck that became infected. Um, we, had, we, were, we were double-handed. We had antibiotics on board, but we had several different types. Um, we were able to put a call out on the, 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 uh, the net. Um, you'll find in most oceans there are, obviously, the ark has, it, has its own uh, net, but um, you put a call out and, and, and say, you know, look, got a problem, do I take X or Y? And, and they all go, well, no, you should take Z, really, but Y is better than X. Um, and, and it, it, but they also say, but don't worry about it. You know, and, and I mean, other occasions where people have said, oh, my autopilot's gone after half an hour on the net, we could have built three new autopilots. Um, but also somebody, you know, somebody was leaving something um, in an island for somebody else to pick up. And it was, it, 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 it is, um, the advantage of it is the community. Um, Jeremy was t saying, you know, the, the whole thing about cruising tends, you know, it is, it's about your personal ambitions for sure, but it is about joining a huge community. And SSB is a, is a great way of staying in touch with it while you're, while you're offshore, because you'd be amazed how quickly 200 boats disappear into nothing when you leave uh, Las Palmas. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it's great to know everybody's there, for sure, but um, you'd be amazed how quickly it, they all disappear, and, and it's, which, is, which is good, you know. You don't want to be bumping into people, but, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's, um, it's a nice community. Well, I was just going to add, it's also sort of a bit like a soap opera sometimes. <laughs> it's great because, you know, you've got these boats, you know, I remember once coming back across the Atlantic and we were listening on um, Herb. Herb's, on Herb's net. And, you know, you had, you had fair weather. And, you know, every day this guy would come on and he'd go, oh, the, the self-steering's gone now. And then the next day it'd be, you know, and I've blown out my mainsail. And everything keeps happening. And you're going, come on, fair weather. Keep going, keep going, fair weather, keep going. The other strange thing is, you know, you get to the Azores, you get to Peter's Bar, and there are all these voices you've heard on the radio, but you have no idea who they are. And you walk into the bar, and you hear all these voices, and you go, ah, oh, that's, that's Dos Tintos. <laughs> And that's all go, Skylight. Skylight. I mean, you, know, you, you become your boat name, don't you? Yes. You know people. Yeah. That, that's actually a word of advice. If you're choosing a name for your boat, <laughs> you might think Owling Gale is very amusing when you're here, but uh, do choose something that you can, you can say over the radio and that people who don't speak English as a first language can pronounce. Otherwise, you can have some quite entertaining moments with boat names. So. Um, could I just ask a little bit for your advice to people who are thinking of going cruising as a couple? What would you sort of say to what kind of top tips would you give people? And, and, and things like roles on the boat. How do you divide up roles on the boat? Do you divide roles on the boat? Do you both do everything? And what's your sort of way of running your boat? Um, I think I think sharing, share, communicate, and look after each other is 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 is, is like an overall thing. Um, I think. A lot of people have blue jobs and pink jobs on the boat, um, but I also know plenty of, or one particular one springs to mind, um, a farmer and his wife w were sailing. She did all the cooking, the cleaning, the washing up. She was also expected to douse the spinnaker and stand her watch, and she didn't know anything about sailing. He basically steered the boat and got some weather occasionally. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was a saint. <laughs> I think perhaps kind of um, advice on, on, whilst you might do that trip with the, with the Yorkshire farmer once, you probably wouldn't do it a second time. Exactly. Um, so for people who want to do it for a second time, how would you, what's the secret to happy cruising together? Well, I think as Lou said, you know, it, it's sort of, it, it, 
it's also a respect for what you do. I mean, on board, we both sort of share navigation, really. I mean, you know, occasionally there'll be, you know, there'll be somewhere where, you know, I'll go up, you know, we're going here, we're going there, usually from prior experience. But otherwise, there are certain sort of things which, which happen. I mean, Lou does radio and the electrics, and that's because she's a much better electrician than me. I do it the Kiwi way, with bearing off a couple of wires, you know, screwing them together and putting some tape around them. Lou does the whole soldering bit with special fittings. I mean, you know, it's just good. I do the engine. Um, and we can and have you sort of developed those roles over time? Or is it because yeah. yes. I like doing certain things, therefore I specialise in those rather than... No, it's, it's sort of just evolved. Uh, we're also a pain to sail with because we've been sailing and living on boats for so long that we hardly ever talk to each other in terms of giving, you know, especially not shouting, but, you know, which we don't do on board, but we hardly even, you know, I'll go up forward, you know, if I'm putting a reef in the main, let's say, I'll go up forward, you know, I'll look back, and who knows when I look back, you know, to bring the helm up a bit, then, you know, when I've got the bullhorn on and I've taken it up tight, Lou will, Lou will know to, you know, to pull the main sheet back in a bit. And it's all done, actually, without any orders being shouted, which, when it's really windy, is difficult anyway, because, you know, it's, there's a lot of, what? <laughs> um, and we try to keep, you know, make sure we don't have a shouty boat. Now, when we have crew on board, which is not that often, but funnily enough, this time going across the Atlantic, we will. Um, it's a pain because, you know, they, they want to actually be instructed and in what to do, you know. I'm sort of looking at them and going, it's like, don't you know what to do now? <laughs> oh, right, okay. Yes, now I've got to say, okay, take the haggard up tight or whatever. Um, it's a difficult but, transition. <laughs> but I also defy, you know, especially when you're going, and a lot of boats I know are double-handed. I also defy anyone um, that when... <coughs> You know, your partner, your lover, your wife, or whoever comes up at three o'clock in the morning to take his or her watch um, with a cup of tea, that you don't fall in love with them all over again. Because, you know, it is, it is a magic moment. You know, and you sit and have a little talk, you look at the stars, and then you go down and sleep. And there is a, there is a wonderful trust about it all, which is, is, a, is a rare thing, I think. Could I just ask you to talk about um, what it is that attracts you to ocean sailing? You kind of touched on some of it there. Can we explore that theme a little? Yeah, I mean, I've always said that I'm not a big fan of ocean sailing. It's to get to the other side. Um, and in lots of ways it is. But there is, a, there is that thing. I mean, anybody who says that they don't have butterflies when they leave, I think is either incredibly thick or is is just not thinking about things. Um, you know, you sort of, you get out there and sort of for the first day and the first night you've got so much adrenaline going that you keep going, you know. The second, the second night still shed loads of adrenaline, you know, and so you're there and you're not sleeping very well. Third night, you're going, I want to be at home. I want to be sitting in front of a fire with a large brandy and watching television. And then somehow magically, in the fourth night, it all clicks and your biorhythms click in and all of a sudden you're going down there and sleeping for three hours. And when, you're, when your head hits the pillow, you're out like that, having deep sleep. And then you wake up and you're refreshed. Lou, Lou what is it for you that you enjoy about being on the boat, whether it's ocean sailing or, or just being on the boat? What, what's the I think, attraction for you? I think space is... is, is That's an ironic thing on a... On a Relatively small, 46 by 7 foot space. Or okay, foot space. <laughs> space from 21st century technology, from, 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 from the immediacy of, or the apparent immediacy of, 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 of work. Um, but I know a lot of people have mentioned it, but the stars are awesome. Um, and they really are um, unbelievable. I have to admit that on one early sort of uh, longish trip back into into the med, um, I was on watch, and there were various. There was a bit of shipping around, but nothing, nothing, nothing too close. And uh, 
it came to uh, change over time, and I got got Rod up and and, and made a cup of tea and 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 uh, just talked about what was where, and I said, "Oh, it looks like we've got got." One coming coming up over there, and I went down to get the tea, and Rod had a look round and placed everything, and said, "So about this ship up ahead?" He said, "Do you mean that one?" <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I did. Um, and we also had a, a, another another one going across the Atlantic. Um, you will have one of your crew will go. There's a ship every night <laughs> at six o'clock when the sun goes down. It's not, it's Venus. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, it's the stars. On a more philosophical note, ph <laughs> philosophical note um, what is it that, that cruising means to you? What, what kind of, how would you sum up the essence of, of what it is that you're, you're doing out there? I think it's partly what Lou just said, that space. It's getting away from, you know, when we're here and the daily grind of everything we do, and even if we don't have a daily grind, it just seems as endless emails, telephone calls, uh, you know, and it heaps up. And you don't have that space for, for, for just sitting back and thinking about things. And I like that space. I like that space, you know, on the night watch, where I'm up there by myself. There's just the sound of the boat plowing through the sea, you know, occasional little crack of a rope. Um, and I can think about, you know, sort of, bigger stuff, you know, it may be rubbish, but that doesn't matter, it seems grand. Um, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's not what it once was, but I think it's still a huge uh, privilege to be able to explore um, the world on a boat, and I think along the way, you, you get to explore yourself as well and, and, and I think you know um, the, I think the reasons why you leave change um, you know may stay the same but but the reasons why you continue will continually change as, 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 as you change I think I think that's a, um, what you don't realize when you start out. <laughs> Before we uh, close the session, do we, would anyone like to ask any questions of, of Rod and Lou? Any? Great audience participation. Oh, yes, Serena. It's part time. <laughs> it's part time. Yes, sir. I hate to say it, but do you have a washing machine? Do you have a washing machine? On your boat, I assume, rather than your house. Absolutely, yeah. It's the bane of my life when I'm cruising, it's washing by hand. No, no, you don't wash by hand. Everywhere you go, there's a nice little place ashore where you take it. I mean, I do the washing at home. Not, I mean, you know, we share the washing at home. But I hate folding things. If you, if you take it to, to some nice little person who washes it for you, it comes back so neatly folded. I mean, it's brilliant. It's called the washing fairy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's not me. I do do, yeah, I, I wash things in smalls, in buckets, but yeah, no, the rest goes to some nice person uh, on shore. Yes. So how, how do you power your boat? I mean, it's electricity, water and things. So have you got generators, have you got... The question is, what power do you have on your boat? Do you use generator or other means? So we run pretty, a, pretty, a pretty simple boat in terms of that. So, no, we don't have a generator. Um, we don't have a windmill. We have a couple of solar panels that are in entirely the wrong place, so that they're not very effective. Um, what... what I am fitting this time is um, just a, a, hydro a hydro generator. So, you know, it's just the one which goes off the back. Um, it'd be interesting to see because I've heard that lots of them keep picking up bits of seaweed and things, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But if it puts out half of the power that was stated in the literature, then I'm quite zen. I'm also the amp miser. We'll be the I, I'll, I'll second that. Having just done a transatlantic with a Watt and Sea hydro turbine on the back, it was awesome. We, we were pumping out the amps from that thing. Really, really amazing. And uh, yes, you do hook a bit of weed on it. Uh, I got quite adept at the boat hook of pushing the weed off. So, um, yeah, good, good, good bit of gear, definitely. Um, uh, right, good. Um, what I would like to kind of wrap up with is. Um, 
as I say, part of the objective of the weekend is to inspire people. So what might be your favourite place or the best moment you've had on the boat that you're prepared to share with the public? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, one of the things I'd say is just, do it. you know, the first boat I sailed down to Greece was 20 foot long. I mean, you know, you could sit in the cockpit and trail your hand in the water. It was, it was small, low, and should probably have never left an estuary. Um, but it got there. I, you know, gradually the boats have progressed up. I mean, we, you know, for everybody who goes and, and goes off crossing oceans and sailing to places, it is partially dependent on your wallet. And we are probably in the in the low to medium you know, scale of, of going. But that doesn't mean that you won't have as much fun as any of the others who have, you know, boats which cost an awful lot more and, uh, and, and the boat is fully equipped, you know, with, with everything singing and dancing. Um, it's, you know, it is about your, your attitude to this whole adventure and enjoying where you're being. Yeah, so, favourite moment, uh, best place, uh, where's the sort of one memory you have of cruising? <laughs> I just got this picture after you just yeah. codified the, the, the question of, 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 of the first time having a, a shower in the cockpit um, on a rolly boat. There were only two of us on board, it has to be said. Um, it's quite fun. It's, it's you know... And not cold, you know. I mean, you could, you could, you know. I don't think it's probably one of those things that, that people generally do around here. But I think that's a sort of, on the way across the, the Atlantic, when it's warm enough to have a have a, have a shower sitting in the cockpit. Okay, it's rolly, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's uh, it's a sort of signifier of, of, of where you are. You're in the tropics yeah. when you can shower outdoors. Yeah. Too, definitely, super. Um, before we wrap up for the evening, uh, just a quick reminder, we have an amazing Caribbean buffet. Um, if you haven't yet purchased your dinner tickets, if you'd like to see Sally and the team at the back there, they're more than happy to sort you out with them. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to, to Rod and to Lou for sharing some of your cruising life with us. It's been fun talking to you and it's made me chuckle. There's a few memories it's brought back for me as well. So thank you very much for sharing with us. It's been a pleasure having you this evening. <laughs>